Hey, what's up guys, it's Matt with the Movement System. In this video, we're gonna talk all about muscle structure and function. We're gonna be going over the most important things about muscle physiology that if you're studying for the CSCS exam, you will need to know to get questions right. Also, at the end of this video, I'm gonna have practice questions, so if you are studying for the CSCS, you can review some of the information we talk about in the video and practice with real practice questions. Let's go ahead and dive into it. Okay, so to start off, we need to understand the structure of a muscle before we can understand the function of a muscle. This picture is a really good breakdown of how the muscle layers work. And the important thing to know here is the different layers of connective tissue or muscle fascia. There are a lot of things going on in this picture, but I wanna highlight three important different layers of connective tissue. The outermost layer around the entire muscle is the epimyceum. If we go down a layer, surrounding one group of muscle fibers or a fascicle of muscle fibers would be perimyceum. And then at the smallest level is endomyceum surrounding one individual muscle fiber. So we need to know epimyceum is the biggest, then peri, then endomyceum. Those are the three layers and you wanna remember those in order, epi biggest, peri in the middle, and then endomyceum being the smallest. Now we wanna understand why these muscle fibers are grouped the way that they are. And the way that this works is we have a fasciculus of fibers, which is a group of fibers that might be 10 fibers, 100 fibers, 1,000 fibers. It really depends on the muscle that we're looking at, but that group of fibers all acts together as one motor unit. A motor unit is a fasciculus of fibers and the nerve that innervates it. And one nerve can go to 1,000 fibers and if that nerve is activated, all 1,000 of those fibers activate. This is called the all or nothing principle. And if you hear motor unit, that's just specifically referring to that group of fibers and the nerve that innervates that group. Again, surrounding that fasciculus or that motor unit is the perimyceum. One other important point to mention about the structure here is that even one muscle fiber is not the smallest level. It goes smaller than that down to one myofibril. Now the myofibrils don't have a layer of connective tissue around them. Again, the smallest layer of connective tissue is that endomyceum around one entire muscle fiber. But within that single muscle fiber, there are still thousands of myofibrils which are made up of actin and myosin. Later in the video, when we get to actually forming cross bridges, we'll talk more about that structure at the very smallest level. All right, if you guys are in my CSCS study group or listening to the Movement System podcast and my CSCS prep episodes there, you may have already heard me talk about how important it is to understand the steps of a muscle contraction. This is fairly complicated to learn in the book because the information is spread out through the entire first chapter, but I've condensed it into seven steps that we're gonna to cover today in this video. So pay attention and take notes because you need to know all seven of these steps, the order of these steps, and the details of these steps to answer questions correctly on the CSCS exam. Step number one, we have to create an action potential. This is generally created in the primary or the secondary motor cortex of the brain. That doesn't really matter. Just know that the brain is sending a signal down to the muscle to activate. So if I wanna contract my bicep, I have to create the signal in my brain and then start sending that signal down the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, all the way to the neuromuscular junction to then get that muscle to activate. So step number one is creating the signal. Step number two is propagating that neuromuscular signal all the way to the neuromuscular junction. And the primary neurotransmitter involved in transmitting that signal, that nerve signal, is acetylcholine. That's abbreviated ACH. And you wanna know that that's the primary neurotransmitter that's getting the signal from the brain all the way to the muscle to tell it to activate. Step number three is crossing the neuromuscular junction. Now, each nerve is connected to a group of muscle fibers, it kinda looks like this. That signal or that action potential went down the nerve all the way from the brain, down the nerve all the way to the muscle, and now that acetylcholine has to go across the neuromuscular junction and specifically activate the sarcolemma. Now you're probably wondering what is the sarcolemma and how does this acetylcholine thing activate it? What we talked about, acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter, so it's just basically the thing that's sending the signal down the nerve. We're good there. But what about that sarcolemma, what is that? 
The sarcolemma is a membrane surrounding the muscle structure that actually helps send the signal to the entire group of muscle fibers. Remember, we have one nerve, but we have a whole bunch of muscle fibers and a whole bunch of myofibrils that that one nerve is supplying. So you can think of the sarcolemma as the thing that helps spread the signal out to the entire muscle. And that leads us to step number four, which is calcium release. Where is calcium released from? Well, we actually have a calcium bank in the muscle, which is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This is basically like the bank of calcium that stores it and it's able to release it whenever that signal is sent all around the sarcolemma. So again, we have that nerve signal that went down to the muscle, crossed the neuromuscular junction, spread out through the sarcolemma, and now activated the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium out all throughout the muscle. Importantly, calcium is what regulates muscle contraction. We need to release calcium and then have essentially like these little debt collectors, they're called calcium sequestering proteins, that go out throughout the muscle and bring it back to the bank. So those calcium sequestering proteins are kind of reducing the calcium that's out in the muscle and allowing muscle contraction to occur. And then the more activation that we get, we can actually let out more calcium. So that process of releasing calcium and, and getting it back is what regulates muscle contraction. But we're not there yet. We just released calcium. How do we actually turn that release of calcium into a muscle contraction? And that leads us to step number five, which is calcium binding to troponin. Troponin is like the doorman and tropomyosin is like the door. So troponin is standing there right next to the door, which is tropomyosin, and it's going to actually move the tropomyosin out of the way to uncover the binding site. So that is step number six. Troponin is going to move the tropomyosin out of the way to uncover the binding site. And then now with that binding site open and ready to go, we can lead into the final step, step number seven, which is forming an actin and myosin cross bridge. That's the final step in this abbreviated version of activating a muscle where you actually have that actin myosin overlap and then that can cause a muscle contraction to occur. And this is essentially what causes the sliding filament theory and allows for more overlap because as that actin and myosin interact now, they can contract concentrically and bring that muscle closer together or they can contract eccentrically and lengthen and lengthen out that sarcomere. So at the microscopic level, that's what's going on to activate a muscle. Before we get into the practice questions, I wanna review this and make sure you're completely understanding and concrete on this. And you should be able to actually explain this to someone else if you know these seven steps well enough. That action potential is created in the brain. It goes down the nerve to the muscle. Acetylcholine crosses the neuromuscular junction and activates the sarcolemma. That causes a release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, calcium being the thing that regulates muscle contraction. That calcium then binds to the troponin, moves the tropomyosin out of the way, and allows for actin and myosin to interact and form the cross bridge cycle, which then causes the sliding filament theory and muscle contraction. You may need to watch that back a few times, but you want to know that process step by step and really understand it well to answer questions on the CSCS exam. So let's go ahead and dive into some practice questions. Question number one, which fascial layer surrounds one individual muscle fiber? Is it A, epimyceum, B, perimyceum, or C, endomyceum? And the answer for this one is C, endomyceum. That surrounds one individual fiber. Question number two, which contraction type would increase the length of the H zone? Choice A, concentric contraction, choice B, eccentric contraction, or choice C, neither? And the answer for this one is B, eccentric muscle contraction, or lengthening of the muscle. We didn't really cover the entire sliding filament theory in this video. You'll have to sign up for my CSCS study course if you want to cover that. But if we go back to this picture from earlier that I briefly showed you, that H zone is the middle chunk of the sarcomere, which has myosin but no actin. As we concentrically contract, we actually reduce or completely eliminate that H zone. And then as we would eccentrically contract or lengthen a muscle, we would actually get more room in that H zone. So lengthening a muscle would increase the H zone, shortening a muscle would shorten the H zone. All right, and then moving on to question number three, when released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, calcium will bind to which of the following? Is it A, tropomyosin? Is it B, actin? Or is it C, troponin? And the answer for this one is C, troponin. The calcium binds directly to the troponin, which then moves the tropomyosin out of the way of the active binding site. So that's why the answer is C, troponin. Of course, there's a lot more information that I would like to teach you about, 
fused tetanus, neuromuscular adaptations, muscle fiber types, sliding filament theory, all that stuff. So if you learn well from videos like this and you're a visual learner and you enjoy seeing these explanations and practice questions, you can consider checking out my study course on themovementsystem.com. My full CSCS study course has videos explaining each chapter in detail so you understand the important points and get over 200 practice questions as well as you go through it. This helps you really understand those important concepts and how they relate to athletes in a way that it really sticks and you get those aha moments rather than being frustrated by just reading the same information in the book over and over again and not really getting it. I also have a 150 question practice test which you can check out at themovementsystem.com. Often people are getting those together so they can go through the study course, work through the material in depth, and then use that extra 150 questions to understand their mistakes and their weak spots and then be able to see the answer key and explanations to actually understand where they made mistakes so they don't make the same mistakes on the full exam. So if you're interested in the study course or practice test, go ahead and check them out in the description below or head to themovementsystem.com. Thanks so much for watching guys and I will catch you in the next one.